Hey, welcome everyone into the NGK Tech Garage. Thank you for joining me today. We have a busy little class scheduled here today lined up where we're gonna be talking about variable valve timing systems and trouble codes. Specifically today, we are gonna be featuring the uh, 2.4 liter Ecotech engine. This happens to be a 2012 uh, Buick Lucerne, neck, uh, not Lucerne, Verano. Yeah, Verano, Buick Verano, sitting next to me, 2.4 liter in there. That's going to be our, our featured vehicle for today. Now, unfortunately, like many of the 2.4s, this one had issues at one point in its life. It's been repaired. Um, it does not currently have any issues, but we're going to use it to perform the test that we would on a vehicle that has issues. So play along with me. Unfortunately, I was unable to find a vehicle in time that had VVT issues, but it's not going to keep the story from being told because this is something that's incredibly common. In fact, if we look here on this vehicle and many of the 2.4 liters, this is just a screenshot from Identifix, you can see the top searches for this vehicle. The top three searches for a 2.4 liter is the 14, the 10, and the 11. Those are all variable valve timing related codes on this engine. So it's a common issue that we're running into today. So I figured let's talk about how the system works, what exactly the trouble codes are, and let's get further into it than just doing a simple resistance test on, on our two variable valve timing solenoids right here. Let's, let's go further into it and actually look at what happens if it's not a variable valve timing solenoid, right? If it's not that simple fix, that easy swap of the solenoid, what else could it be? So we're gonna look into it a little bit further today. Remember, stick around at the end of the class. We will have the t-shirt giveaway question um, for your opportunity to win a shirt. So uh, the chat already seems to be rolling. There appears to be a lot of love in there. Keith just out reminding everybody how soon Christmas is coming. It's, it's definitely coming up fast. Uh, thank you everybody for joining from all over the world today. It's uh, really amazing at, at uh, how far this, this reaches. Um, so, Let's get into the variable valve timing system. We're going to start with the codes that are non-circuit codes. P0014 and P0011 are going to be the two codes that we're going to focus kind of on today. They're going to be what we're going to chase after if this vehicle were throwing those codes. Now, unfortunately, again, it has no codes, but just guys, can you pretend with me today that we're chasing one of these codes? We're going to go through that testing procedure. We also have the ability on this vehicle to set a P0016 or a 17. We're not gonna spend as much time on these codes today, but through explaining the system's operation, you'll understand what it takes to set these codes. And right off the bat, 10 to, greater than 10 degrees advanced or retarded in relationship to the crankshaft. So what that's saying is our cams position is the actual cam position versus desired is more than 10 degrees out. That's really what that that means. And then our 13 and our 10 codes, these are very, very common codes to come up on here. There's tons of YouTube videos already focusing on these codes, looking at the solenoids, wire, <coughs> excuse me, wiring or PCM issues. Solenoids are incredibly common on this car. They're not hard to change out. And this, a lot of the testing that goes with them is pretty simple. So we'll cover some of that today. But again, that's not gonna be our focus. Our focus is gonna be on system performance codes 11 and 14 because they're more um, more generic. There's more possibilities that could be related to those codes. Think of like uh, the generic, you know, EVAP failure code, right? The what PO 440 EVAP system failure code. This is kind of that way. We have a failure within the variable valve timing system, but there's so many components or variables that it could be. We can't pin it down to one uh, one specific direction. So before we get into actually looking up this code in particular, let, let's talk about the variable valve timing system. Let's start off with why do cars even have it? Because I feel like this is something that gets overlooked a lot of times when we're talking about system operation. There's really two reasons to have variable valve timing on our car, performance and emissions control, okay? If we vary the cam timing, we can vary the way the engine runs, we can open the intake valve earlier or later. We could open the exhaust valve earlier or later. That will affect the way air enters into our cylinder or leaves our cylinder or 
is brought back into the cylinder under a scavenging effect. So we can kind of make a little bit of an EGR effect using VVT. We can vary the intake cam to open that valve later or earlier to give us more power or less power depending on what that engine is wanting at that point. So it gives us a little bit of the best of both worlds. If you drove this engine, 2.4 liter, without VVT and then drove it with VVT, they would feel very different if it's got VVT on there as a performance modification type of thing. There are some vehicles out there that are only going to use the exhaust cam in a way of emissions control. So on that one, you probably really won't notice a difference with that, but there are others out there that run dual VVT. There's even others out there like the camshafts here. These are out of a 2.5 liter escape. Um, this one is our intake cam and our exhaust cam. So we have a traditional fixed sprocket exhaust cam. You'll notice no trigger wheel on here, right? On the 2.5 liter in the escape and fusion, there's no cam sensor for the exhaust side. Our cam sensor on this one is on the back side here. This is our trigger wheel for our cam sensor on, on there on our intake cam, okay? So we'll get into the components within these camshafts in just a second. Let's talk about the electrical aspect of variable valve timing, because that really is only a small role in this entire system's operation. So here's a wiring diagram. I always think this is a good spot to start. Again, this is specific to a 2012 Verano, but uh, a lot of times our variable valve timing is driven in the same manner. We have our solenoids here, variable valve timing, solenoid, camshaft position actuator, oil control valve, uh, my mind's blanking on other names, but there's probably 10 to 15 different names out there for the same component, depending on vehicle manufacturer. Now, what's a little bit unique about this, we're gonna hard ground these things within the PCM. This is not switched, not pulsed, anything like that. This is power side driven, okay? Our PCM will pulse with modulate the power side. A Little bit unique, normally we see ground side driven, um, just part of this circuit. We just have to know that when we get into actually doing our testing that we expect the ground to pulse, uh, excuse me, the power to pulse, not the ground. This solenoid, this valve, this actuator, all this thing is, is a electromechanical device that allows for oil flow. Two wires, I guess probably can't see in there, but two wires open up or, or apply a magnetic field when current is applied and it moves uh, basically a plunger inside here. When that plunger moves, we flow oil into a certain passage. When that passage is filled with oil, we're able to actually move the camshaft itself independent of the ring that's tied to the timing chain. So what exactly does that look like? Here's the animation of what that looks like. So you can see our timing components on the front of the engine. Our cam phaser, this is called a phaser on the front of the camshaft. Our solenoid is gonna move and we're gonna flow oil into a certain passage. That oil is gonna flow through our camshaft itself and into the phaser to either advance or retard our cam timing. When we change this back the other direction, we flow oil back the other way, we bring the camshaft back to its home point or in some situations we could actually retard the timing further than its home point. It depends on the, on the style of system at that point. But we're taking our electric me electromechanical device, our VVT solenoid, this guy right here, we're feeding it power and ground, pulse width modulated, we're controlling a valve that's inside of here and flowing oil in and out of this device. So what this means is that our oil today is critical for these systems. And I believe this is a lot of the reason of why we're seeing variable valve timing codes coming up on cars. The oil life in general has gotten better, but our oil intervals, maintenance intervals, seems to have exceeded the actual life of the oil in a lot of cases. It is very common for these things or these systems to fail due to a lack of maintenance, a lack of oil changes, okay? So our oil is not just being used as a lubricant anymore, it's actually being used as a, let's call it a hydraulic fluid, right? We can't put in 
10W40, 10W50, whatever, if we have an engine rattle to try to quiet down some noise. We have to run the proper viscosity oil. We have to run the proper amount. We have to make sure that it's clean and it's not dirty and uh, maybe full of fuel from a flooded engine. I mean, there's a lot of things that play into the oil on these systems to be used to control our actual camshaft phaser. So let's jump over to this engine that I have over here to kind of explain how this system operates on an actual engine. So you can see we have, this is a V6 3 liter, this is also out of a Ford. We um, have two dead Ford engines in the shop apparently, but uh, 3 liter V6 and on this one we have a fixed exhaust camshaft on both sides and we have an actuated or, or cam phaser we were able to change our intake camshaft timing on here. So when we spin this engine over, when this guy spins over, the relationship between our camshaft and our crank or camshafts and our crankshaft is fixed by this chain, right? As this engine's spinning over, it's fixed. So on an engine without VVT, our timing would always be the same if, as long as there's no issues. Now what we're gonna do, we apply oil through our solenoid, through this guy right here. It's gonna feed that pressure in through our phaser. This is our phaser assembly right here. This is actually our pickup or our trigger wheel here for our cam sensor. But we're gonna feed pressure into this phaser and we're gonna essentially release the camshaft. And I, I think release is a good word here. There's a lot of confusion as to what exactly happens when that oil pressure is applied. And I think release is the right word. What we're gonna do, See if we can get a close up here. There we go. There's a pin in here. Well, there's supposed to be a pin in here. I've pulled it out for demonstration purposes. But when we apply oil pressure to this thing, we're gonna release that pin and we're gonna allow our camshaft to move independent of our timing gear or where our chain sits. So our chain is gonna sit on this outer portion right here. Our oil yeah, too close, is going to flow through these holes. It's going to flow into the phaser, and our chain is locking, locking this guy down, right? It's holding this, this ring, these teeth here, tight. Oh, no, I got it stuck. So then what's actually happening, let's see if we can get a couple lobes on here. With our gear securely held, you see I'm able to move the camshaft. Right? Now it's not a lot. Many times it's about 25 degrees of change. But this little bit can drastically affect the way the engine runs. So by applying oil pressure, using it as a hydraulic fluid at this point, we're able to phase or change our camshaft's position in small amounts, very little, or 25 degrees. and anywhere in between, depending on how the computer, how far the computer controls this guy open. If we open this thing 100% of the way, we're gonna apply full oil pressure to this phaser, we're gonna move this cam 25 degrees. If we apply only halfway, well then we're gonna apply less oil pressure and it's gonna move less. It's gonna constantly vary our solenoid to bring our cam into the position that it wants. It's desired. Because again, we're gonna use the cam sensor to monitor the position in relationship to the crankshaft here, down here would be our crank sensor. We're gonna watch this trigger wheel. We're gonna watch this trigger wheel and we're gonna compare the two. The computer's gonna take that into effect and it's gonna desire a certain amount. It's gonna say, I wanna see the camshaft shift 10 degrees. 10 degrees advance on an intake cam. From there, the actual camshaft signal will shift 10 degrees advanced in relationship to the crankshaft position sensor. So if it doesn't do that, it sets a code. If it is outside of that 10 degree mark, remember that P016 and 17 code was greater than 10%, if it's outside of that mark, we set a P016 or P017 code, depending on if we're dealing with intake or exhaust. All right, so we're, we're monitoring this system. We'll go back to our wiring diagram here. We're monitoring this system, and, and thank you, GM for including our three vital sensors with our actuators in the same diagram. These are our VVT system tattletales. 
we're going to watch the position of our two camshafts. Camshafts? Shafts? I don't know. Probably not proper English on that one, guys. But intake or exhaust in relationship or correlation to crankshaft position sensor. So you've heard camshaft crankshaft correlation. We've talked about it in other videos that we're seeing it happen commonly. Uh, 3.6 liter GM, 3.5 liter EcoBoost Ford. Um, that's rattling off the top of my head. Those are the two that have come up, this 2.4 liter, that come up very commonly for what's considered camshaft crankshaft correlation or the timing between our camshafts one or two and the crankshaft are out of sync, they're out of spec, there's something wrong between the way those signals are, are reading. Uh, the 4 liter Toyota 4Runner that I did the video on a couple years ago, that was a camshaft crankshaft correlation issue that ended up being a stretched chain. It wasn't enough to set a potential code that may be related to actually the chain jumping or being severely out of spec, it was just slightly out of spec that it set the, let's call it the intermediate code. And that's kind of what we're seeing with this vehicle as well. When we get to, to code definitions for the um, 11 and the 14, you'll, you'll see that the performance code for intake and exhaust on this car, kind of a, an intermediate code on here. So here you can see a close up of the oil galleys that are actually built into the head. These are going to feed directly into the camshaft again, and then from that camshaft, we will feed those out to the phaser. Here you can see just kind of a, a breakdown of what it looks like oil control solenoid or VVT solenoid, whatever you might want to call it, is going to be supplied oil, and it's going to feed it to a certain channel. That channel will then feed to one side of the phaser, and then we'll change the position of this center, uh, it's called a valve and we'll supply oil a different direction and we'll move that camshaft phaser back. So what exactly is it that makes these things so hypersensitive, right? If oil, why, do, why does oil play such a, such a role in this situation? We have valves inside of our transmissions, right? Tons of valves. We don't hear a lot of issues with that. Why is engine oil, why are VVT solenoids so common for failure? A lot of it is because of the way these things are, are made. Here you can see a breakdown, or a, this is a solenoid that's all pulled apart. This is one that we actually manufacture here. Here you can see the, the electro part, right? This is our coil of windings. This is where our magnetic field is going to be created. We're going to feed power and ground into our connector, and we're going to move this valve inside of this outer piece right here. There's no seals between this inner piece and this outer piece. There's no rubber seal, there's no O-ring, there's nothing like that that seals this thing. It's a it's a metal on metal type of seal. The, the, the tolerance, the clearances are very, very tight inside of that solenoid. If you have poor tolerances, poor clearances, you could end up actually bleeding oil pressure off. So when you're actually trying to supply a certain amount to that camshaft to say move it 15 degrees, Maybe you actually only moved it 12 because your clearances are too low and you're actually draining some of that pressure off. They're hypersensitive. If you get junk in the oil, if the oil is too thin, if it's not containing the, proper, the, the right properties, if the oil is even too thick, it can all affect the way this valve moves and flows oil through this system. The flow rate is incredibly important as well as making sure that it doesn't leak out to a different path. So when you see stuff like this, these are definite problems. Right? We're not allowing the oil to flow through the solenoid. We're blocking it with debris. The issue with this is who's, the, who's at fault here? Is it the VVT solenoid's fault that it's covered in metal? It's definitely the result of something else, right? If you change out the solenoid on this engine, if I pull this solenoid out right now on this engine and it looks like this one here, I am not putting a new solenoid back in there unless the customer throws a fit and, and they just want to drive the vehicle home and they're going to park it and never drive it again and they're going to whatever. You know how that story goes. They're really going to be driving it everywhere and they'll come back complaining a month later. But realistically, this engine has issues. That metal is coming from somewhere inside of this engine. If our solenoid looks like that, 
best case scenario is to inform the customer that shop for a different vehicle, put a used engine in, put a reman engine in, do something else because you are going to have a repeat failure that as a shop, I would not want to have to warranty that, right? This is not the solenoid's fault for failing. If you put a new solenoid in there, it will happen again. Now who's on the hook for that unless you've cleared that with the customer first. So keep that in mind when you're dealing with VVT. It's just like spark plugs and ignition coils or I mean a million different things. It's the, what, what happened first? Who took out who? In this case, it's pretty obvious that the metal is coming from external of the solenoid. It's being trapped in the screen. It's not the solenoid's fault in this point, okay? Make sure you fix the cause, not the result, all right? So let's back up here. Um, anything else I kind of want to cover on operation? Does that kind of make sense? Does that kind of clear up maybe any confusion? There are vehicles, now not every variable valve timing system is on a dual overhead cam or even single overhead cam motor. Uh, GM runs cam and block and they have the actuator mounted right on the, the camshaft. So it doesn't have to be dual overhead cam to feature variable valve timing, okay? Uh, it's just, we commonly see it that way. And I mean, most, most engines today are going with a uh, overhead cam design. Any questions on operation of variable valve timing? Ooh, Keith is asking questions. Let's see here. A solenoid opening and closing super quickly would allow less fluid movement and a slower one would allow more, potentially. But is the solenoid actually able to open super quickly? So if we pulse with this thing and vary that pulse width greatly, you gotta remember there's a time involved with opening and closing that solenoid. It doesn't happen as instantly as changing the pulse width. So are we technically bouncing that valve that's inside of the solenoid. If we open the solenoid further or not as far, is it gonna vary our pressure off to the, the phaser? Those are all great questions. And from a diagnostic standpoint, I'm not sure that it, it applies as long as we have proper oil pressure. If we have proper oil pressure and our PCM is properly uh, actuating the solenoid, it's pulse width modulating the power. I think from there, the rest of it is from an engineering standpoint that's not really going to help us fix cars. Um, I think that kind of answers the question. Uh, I knew this would come up, the flush and engine thing. I have this in the presentation coming up a little bit later. Both of these questions, yours as well, Keith, how do we determine the oil pressures making it to the solenoid? These are two very, very good questions. We'll start with flushing an engine. What a tricky question. I think, in my opinion, it's between you and the customer. There has to be an understanding that the junk that's built up inside of the engine is not, most of the time, not the engine's fault. It's not the technician's fault. It's not the shop's fault. The junk in the engine is the customer's fault most of the time, right? Lack of maintenance, bakes on oil deposits, and we run into issues. Most of the time, it's not the vehicle's fault. It's, it's the lack of maintenance. Now it's the customer's decision of what they want to do next. When you loosen that junk up, all that carbon, all that baked on oil, whatever, all that sludge, where does it go? Does the filter catch it all? Can the filter catch it all? What if it doesn't go to the filter right away and it's going through these small oil passages? There's a little bit of risk involved with it, definitely, with putting in some sort of engine flush. Um, <laughs> never the customer's fault, they'll tell you that. It, it's really a little bit dicey. It's worth a shot, I think, to try to revive that engine, to try to get that oil pressure back, to try to clean that junk out. But the customer has to understand that this could cause something to plug up. It could, it could potentially cause blockage going up that's feeding the head. Who knows? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that could 
happen that you just have to make sure the customer's aware of, that they sign off on the fact that we're gonna put something in here that wasn't meant to go in the engine because your engine is dirty because you didn't follow the maintenance guidelines. That's usually the way it goes and hopefully, uh, cross your fingers, it works. Uh, now Keith's question, determining oil pressure is making it to the solenoid. <clears throat> yes, Pat, I agree. Flushing is dangerous. That's a good way to sum it up. How do you determine oil pressure is making it here? Okay. Let's actually go back to that picture here. This guy right here. Okay, those guys right there obviously go to our ports on our camshaft, right? How do we know if there's actually oil getting there? I don't think we do. We can play PCM at this point, and, and we'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. We can make the solenoid work. We can make it electrically work. We can make it open the valve if it's functional, if it's possible. And with that, the camshaft should phase. It should change its position or its angle, okay? Is there a way to actually verify the oil pressure up to there? To be honest with you, I don't know that there is. I don't know, is there a special tool out there that I can pull out my VVT solenoid, insert special tool, and it's got a gauge on top that is matching up to the ports inside of the head? If there is, I've never seen one, but I wouldn't doubt that there, there could be. Can you insert a pressure gauge, I guess, in place of a VVT solenoid? Maybe. You might be able to. If you have a solenoid that you know is functional, that you know the valve is opening inside of there, that you know is able to change its position internal of this guy, if you move this thing and the cam doesn't phase, if it doesn't change its position, you're either lacking oil pressure or you have a bad phaser. Now, if you think one of those two things is happening, you could, and in many tests, you can apply, there we go, you can apply air pressure to one of these two ports and that should move the phaser. So you can check to see if the phaser is able to move under air pressure. If the phaser moves under air pressure, if you have a good solenoid, then really the only other thing it could be is oil pressure, right? Or a lack of oil to the, to the head, to the ports that feed the cam. Um, I mean, I hate to say it, but is that process of elimination at that point? I think due to the design of the way this functions, they haven't given us as technicians a good way to test. As far as I know, there's not a test port to hook up an oil pressure gauge to check oil pressure to the two cams on this engine or any engine. Are there engines out there that you guys have run into that have test ports built in that you can actually check oil pressure being fed to the head, to the, the cams, to the phasers themselves? I'm, I'm sure there are, but I don't know any off the top of my head. What have you guys seen? Justin says, none that I've seen. Frank says, use a bidirectional scan tool to actuate the phaser. I agree, and we'll get to that in just a few minutes. Just unscrew it and let it squirt out everywhere. Sure, I mean, it's going to make a mess, but yeah, pull the solenoid out. Maybe you can start up the engine, and if you have oil flow up there, is that, uh, is that adequate? How do we know if the oil flow is adequate to the phaser. I mean, we're using it again as a hydraulic fluid. That's got to have some sort of specification. That's got to have the ability to be measured, right? We have to be able to see what exactly that spec is. And, and as far as I know, I've never seen an oil pressure variable valve timing spec. Now, when these things are manufactured, when we test these things, when we build these things, there's a specific flow rate that we monitor that our engineers build these things for. But, um, Sorry, I got stopped mid, 
mid thought there when I was reading Keith's comment about uh, a tip before he leaves. Apparently, he's bailing. Thanks a lot, Keith. <clears throat> That's a really good point. So what Keith is saying, and, and we're going to show this in a little bit, we're going to show actually looking at this on a scope, but what he's saying is if we turn this solenoid on and it moves whatever amount, that amount of time that it takes to move that amount, should it should return in that amount of time as well. We apply the oil pressure through it, we turn it off, it should retract back just as quickly. So that's a, that's a really good thing to know, really good thing to check as well. Um, L1 Automotive Diagnostic and Programming LLC says Ford 5.4 has a hole behind the power steering pump. It's really interesting. I have worked on a lot of 5.4s and I have never accessed that hole to uh, check pressure. I know there's ways to check oil pressure on that engine, but I didn't know of a way to actually check it up to the head. Very, very interesting. That'd be kind of fun to play with and see. Um, that's... Keith, that's a great idea that making something. It'd be kind of cool to make a tool that you could insert in place to check. Um, oh, it's Keith Perkins. Sorry, Keith, I didn't realize. I guess I should have realized that that was you. Um, but uh, it'd be kind of cool, right, to have just a drop-in tool. I mean, you'd need a lot of them, right? There's a lot of different variable valve timing solenoids out there. But drop a tool in, and does it have oil pressure applied to it? Because Really, technically, anytime, anytime the engine's running, we're going to have oil applied to our supply port. There's going to be oil being fed to the supply port on this thing. When we move the valve, that's when we apply it to the different regions. But at all times, this thing should have oil supplied to it. So if we were to somehow, somebody was to develop a tool that could test that supply port pressure just by inserting a VVT, there we go. There's an, there's an idea for uh, any tool companies that could be watching. I don't know. But that would be kind of, uh, kind of, kind of interesting and uh, incredibly useful because checking oil pressure can be very difficult. And, and really on this vehicle, it would just take a matter of minutes. SoCal Production says, hi, Mom. <laughs> All right. Let's get back to this guy. Let's get into our actual codes. Uh, real quick, before... We get into the codes and, and doing some diag on here. Did anybody have any other questions, any further questions on the way the system operates, on the way we're using oil as a hydraulic fluid to actuate, to move our actual camshaft uh, position, the time or the, the, yeah, I guess the time or the degrees in which the valves are opened on our engine. Does everybody kind of understand how that works now before we get into actually looking at our trouble codes? Any further questions on that? Mario's out of here. He's got to run, he says. Yes, Mike, that's a good idea. Fabricate a tool from an old solenoid. Sounds great. Um, do, 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 do. A lot of new names in here, guys. That's awesome. Welcome, everybody who's never been here before. Um, Victor, I'm going to talk about ohm readings in a little bit. Uh, TDM, we're working with a 2012 Verano 2.4 liter today. That's the car we're playing with. All right, let's actually get into this vehicle. We're going to get into the codes now. Um, and take a look at what we've got as long as everybody's clear on the operation because everything that we do from here on out is going to be based upon the understanding of how this system operates, how we're using oil and pressure to control a mechanical system. So let's look at our two codes. Today, like I said, we're going to focus on the 11 and the 14. These are our middle of the ground codes. These are our performance codes. These aren't circuit codes and these aren't necessarily your timing chains jumped codes, okay? First and foremost, first condition for running this T DTC, and for those of you who don't look at conditions for running the DTC, you really should. You can find a lot of information within this few lines of data. We cannot have variable valve timing, oops, variable valve timing circuit codes, 10 and 13, cannot be set we also can't have a 16 and 17 code, which again is, can be related to uh, sticking of the system, maybe a lack of oil flow, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of things that can cause those codes that relate a lot to our 11 and 14. These are just more extreme, okay? And you'll see exactly what I mean in just a second. 335, 36, 40, 41, these are um, cam sensor, crank sensor related codes, right? If we're relying on and using our camshaft position sensors, 
intake and exhaust, and our crankshaft position sensor to be able to judge or determine the correlation or the, the spacing essentially between the camshaft or camshafts and the crankshaft, we have to be able to trust those sensors. If our sensors themselves are setting a code intermittently or all the time or the computer can't trust them at that point, there's no way it's going to run an 11 or 14 code test if you can't trust the tattletale of that system, one of those sensors, it can't run the test to, to check the variable valve timing system for performance. We have, to, we have to finish step A, which is trust the sensors, before we can go to step B, which is trust the operation of a system. Okay, So that's why it's really good to note that we can't be setting an 11 and 14 if we have cam sensor codes, if we have solenoid circuit codes, or if we have a 16 or 17 greater than 10 degree difference codes. Okay. Conditions for setting our DTC. So this is where our middle ground comes in. What we're saying here is that our desired position of our camshaft is greater than six degrees difference from our actual for more than 13.5 seconds. Now, I don't know who comes up with 13 and a half seconds. It seems like a random number. For whatever reason, that's the way they designed the code for, um, or the, the parameters for this code but six degrees is a vital number. Remember that as we move forward, six degrees difference to set an 11 or a 14 code, okay? Not 10 degrees, that's the 16 or 17 code, that's kind of the next step. Six degrees for this code of difference, really between our actual and desired. A couple diagnostic aids within the codes from GM. Obviously, engine oil has a major impact on this system. Low oil can cause a lot of issues. The third one is the most important here. Inspect the engine for recent mechanical repairs. An incorrectly installed cam, actuator, or timing chain can cause this DTC. So we're working with a lot of components here, right? We're working with a potential oiling issue, which could be mechanical related, sludge related, lack of maintenance related, who knows? But we're dealing with a hydraulic fluid potential issue. We're dealing with potential issue of base engine mechanical in a camshaft or timing chain issue. And then we're dealing with an electromechanical issue, potentially with a camshaft actuator, a solenoid that's commanded on and off with electricity that's moving a valve to allow, allow hydraulic pressure to flow. We have a ton of variables here to look at on this type of system. It's not cut and dry. It's not look for five volts and look for ground and look for a signal return to, to measure a sensor. It's not cut and dry and simple like that. There's a lot of different avenues that we can approach here. So really what could be wrong with this thing? We could have an oiling issue, a solenoid issue, a wiring issue, or a timing issue. We have four boxes to jump into here and travel down in that path. But how do you know where to go? Where do you start? Because to start with one of these could take a lot of your time. You could end up two hours into this engine and not be any further ahead than you were two hours previous. So do you guess? Do you change the oil? Do you change a solenoid? You change a PCM? You just keep guessing? Well, let's look at what guessing could actually cost. These are numbers specific to this vehicle. According to, again, we're using Identifix here, based upon $100 an hour of labor, the number one fix for a P011 code, or P014, I can't remember, I think it's actually 14 would be exhaust cam. The number one fix is the actuator solenoid. The VVT solenoid is the number one fix. Take this into a shop, you're gonna pay an hour diag, Labor time on this is 1.4 hours, so it's $240 plus the cost of the solenoid. Okay, so let's call it $300, $350 to guess at this car. Now this guess is based upon the confirmed fix list, right? The silver bullets, the uh, pl kind of playing the odds here, but is that our failure? We could have an engine oil issue. So let's, let's change the oil, right? You're going to pay your hour diag again. Then you're going to pay, what, $39.99 for an oil change? I, I don't know. I changed my own oil. I can't remember the last time I paid for an oil change. But $39.99, let's call it, for an oil change? Um, is that going to fix it? So now you're $140 bucks into this thing. Is it fixed? Is it not? Again, we're guessing. Let's guess at the timing chain, right? That's the fifth most common thing to be replaced to fix a P0014 code on this 2.4 liter. Now we're getting expensive, right? We're going to pay our hour diag. According to labor time on here, it says 4.6 hours. Seems 
maybe a little light, I don't know. I've actually personally never done a chain on, a, on one of these newer uh, 2.4s. But uh, according to this thing, we're looking at about $560 in labor, plus all the attaching components. I mean, you're probably looking between eight and 1200 bucks to put a timing chain and the attaching components into this vehicle. Again, that's a heck of an expensive guess. What path do we go down? Do we just sell it all to the customer? Yeah, you got a uh, P0014. You know, it could be this, it could be this, it could be that. Let's just, let's just sell it all because it could all be covered. But what happens if it's an actual oil pressure issue? Now you stuck $1,200 into a motor that is going to do the same thing that it's doing now. So we need ways to test. And we want to do the simplest of things first because work smarter, not harder, right? No sense in diving down a path that's going to just lead us to a heck of a lot of work and even more headaches. So let's get into, again, what could be wrong. I believe oil to be the easiest first check. So we have a lot of things that we can check with our oil. First and foremost, pop the hood and check the level, right? That's the easiest thing to do. It takes a matter of seconds. I like to get a white piece of paper, napkin, paper towel, whatever. And I like to first wipe off the dipstick and I like to look and see kind of what color it is here. Kind of a brownish color. It's not black. Doesn't look horrible. But we'll get this guy all wiped off and we'll check the level. Okay. Who would have thought that we could have a, maybe a couple hundred people watching somebody check for oil level on YouTube? Really cool, right? Found a way to finally check oil level on YouTube. Anyways, we're checking our level. It looks good. The color doesn't look horrible. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you guys can see here. Eh, not really. All right. But one thing to not forget to check for, and maybe it takes a little bit of a, a trained, it's called a trained nose, but I always just take a smell of the oil. Does it smell like fuel? Does it smell like gasoline? If it does, that gas could thin the oil. If that oil is thinned, now its hydraulic principles are different than when it was initially installed. We're essentially changing the viscosity of that oil if the vehicle were flooded or if it maybe has an injector issue or, you know, whatever it could be. So we want to look to see if the oil is clean. We want to make sure it's full and we want to make sure somehow that it's the proper viscosity or if it hasn't had fuel somehow dumped into it. Um, ask the customer. When was the last time you had it changed? Maybe there's an oil change sticker on the, uh, on the windshield. This one is within its oil change um, maintenance schedule like it should be. Uh, does the customer know what the proper viscosity is? Did they have it installed? If you change the oil on it last time, then you're good to go. Just pull your service records. But this one requires 530. And ask the customer, is there 530 oil in there? As for pressure, we could hook a gauge into this thing or we could watch our pressure sensor or pressure switch. Some vehicles have a sensor that's actually going to give you a pressure reading. Most vehicles like this one actually uses a, a switch. Lab testing, how many of you guys are sending oil out to be lab tested? Now, it's not completely unheard of, but it is yeah, kind of a, maybe a little bit expensive. I think maybe, what, 50 bucks a, a test or something like that. You take a sample of the oil, you send it into a lab, and they, they evaluate it, right? So sometimes on, on warranty claims, this would be done potentially, but uh, lab testing is an option for our oil to see if there's contaminants in there, to see if it's maybe the right viscosity, that kind of thing for our oil. Or lastly, just change the oil and cross your fingers, right? And we kind of already talked about flushing of the oil system, but just simply performing an oil change isn't really a a test, it could be a fix. So if I'm going to change the oil and send the car on its way, it's going to be because the oil is incredibly dirty, it's outside of its maintenance interval, or it is low. If it's low, is there a reason for it? Right? We got to look at that. Is there a reason why it's low? Does the customer have to add oil in between oil changes? These 2.4s were kind of known to burn a little bit of oil, right? So if it's low, that's for a reason. That's going to be another avenue that we need to pursue, right? So those are all things that we can look at with oil. On this vehicle, we can look at data. Let's go ahead and fire this thing up quick. 
and we'll just make sure that our pressure sensor or switch on here is reading properly. <clears throat> so we'll go into, I think it's under engine data. I think I might have passed it already. Um, doo -doo 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 Fuel pressure, engine oil pressure switch, okay. Thank you, Scan Tool, for telling me my oil pressure is okay. Is this something to trust all the time? Eh, it depends. A lot of these. Uh, a lot of these oil pressure switches just make sure essentially that the pump is functional. Again, we have no way at this point to verify if the oil is actually making it up through the head to our solenoids. Okay? So, any questions on oil? Hmm, broken oil filter cap. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Microwave test. Oh, that makes sense. If there's metal in oil. Good call on that, Keith. That's kind of interesting. Roll the dice for sure. Okay. All right, let's um, move on to our next avenue, right? We started with oil, let's get on to the solenoid. Now this is where some of the testing, we'll, we'll do some of the testing that's related as well to the, uh, what was it, 10 and 13 codes, right? The actual solenoid codes themselves. Again, all we're really looking at here is a, is a solenoid really not that much different from any other solenoid that we check. So we can do a couple things. We can resistance check it. Guys, as, we've talked about before, I'm not really a fan of resistance testing because it can lead you astray. Now it worked out for us on the, uh, what was that? That was a Lincoln MKS, right? That 3.7? Worked out pretty well on there, right? When we had the injector that was out of spec. Worked out good. Um, but there's been plenty of times when you perform a resistance test and it really doesn't, uh, it doesn't fail. It's within the specification, but the component itself is actually bad. Um, when it's under load or when it's under certain circumstances. Resistance testing is a static test applying a very small amount of voltage through our windings. It's very likely it could pass a resistance test and fail dynamically or when the system's actually being operated. But there are specs generally written, so we might as well check it and see. So let's see here, we're at 11.2. Uh, 11.2 ohms on our intake variable valve timing solenoid. Is that good? Is that bad? Um, you could look up the spec, sure. Um, I believe, I mean, I know it's a known good on this vehicle, but let's say you're diagnosing an intake VVT issue and you're not sure if this is a good spec. Well, we happen to have a known good right next to it. The exhaust solenoid here is going to be the same windings. The only real difference between these, because these are two different part numbers, the only real difference between these two right here is the orientation of the, uh, the holes that are in the head. So we just have to change up the solenoid design, the body a little bit. But really it's the same windings, uh, same connection, all that stuff. Just a black connector versus a gray connector. And we're at um, 11.2 on there. Okay, so you can always verify against your known good next to it, but don't, um, don't bent the house on a, on a resistance check. It can, can lead you astray. Um, what about checking the solenoid for actual operation? I believe somebody already mentioned it. We could check for the engine note to change. Pretty straightforward, right? We could see if the solenoid's able to move. We could check uh, desired versus actual. Makes sense. Let's. Um, Let's get into this. I'm going to flip the key on so the scan tool will stop freaking out at me. The downside 
on this vehicle. And I don't know if it's only just with the snap-on scan tool or if it's with all the scan tools, not sure. The downside is here, guys, that I am not able to actuate the VVT solenoids with the engine running. So we'll go functional, we'll go actuator test, we'll test the solenoids, exhaust or intake cam. First part here, perform the test key on engine off. All right, so on this vehicle, they're not giving us the ability to do this while it's running. So we can't listen to a change in the engine note. This is in no way verifying there's oil flowing through the solenoids. All this is verifying is that we're able to send power and ground to our solenoid and we're able to make it move. That's all we're looking at right here. And when I hit continue, it'll bring this up. I don't know why they even bother giving us data at all because we have no oil flow. And with no oil flow through our solenoid, we're never gonna move our camshaft phaser. First of all, the engine's not spinning. And second of all, we have no pressure to release that lock pin on the front of the cam phaser. So all of this data is kinda useless, but if we turn this thing on, we can see our duty cycle jump up. So right there, intake CMP command 99%. And when I did turn that on, and that's all the time we get with it, when I turned it on, I heard it click. Yay, it can click. A click generally means some sort of mechanical movement. Cool. It can mechanically move. We can also take a look at this with a scope. I have the scope hooked up already. Let's just jump into the, uh, the power side pulse with modulation on here and just take a look at what it looks like. Because... Why not? Let's make sure the PCM is actually sending the proper signal. So we're just gonna stab into the power side here. We'll get the scope opened up. Uh, we'll just increase our time here a little bit, increase our sample rate. 20 volts, that should be okay. We're still key on. So if I go ahead and I'm in the intake cam, run this guy again with the scan tool, and we should see our solenoid turn on. Now, because we're seeing a 99% duty cycle, I'm not expecting a steady solid line at 12 volts. I'm expecting to see some drops, okay? So here we go. Cool, that's what I wanted to see. And that's all the time we get. All right, let's pause the scope. Go back and look at that. And we'll just go ahead and we'll zoom in on just a little bit of it here. So that's what I was hoping to see. Very, very um, focused at the top with essentially 1% dropouts. Okay, so the PCM is sending roughly 12 volts. We'll call it 11.8 volts to, uh, to our, our solenoid and it is being pulsed with. And then our other side is just gonna be a solid ground which we could check just like we would ever always check a ground circuit, okay? What else, if we don't have a scope? I know a lot of you guys don't have scopes. Just throw a meter on it. Because we're doing a pulse width modulation at 99%, if we were doing it at 50%, I would be looking for a different value. But because we're at 99%, our meter's too slow to pick up on everything, to pick up on, like our scope can, that dropout. So what I'm expecting to see here is very close to 12 volts on here. So we'll just bump right into the back side of that. There we go. And we'll turn our solenoid on again. Now if we are at a 50% duty cycle, if, our, if we were somehow able to control the command, if we were at 50%, that 50% duty cycle is from 12 volts to zero. Depending on where our meter is averaging, I would expect to see somewhere around six-ish volts. Now, because this is again at 99, I'm looking to see probably about battery voltage, about 11.7, maybe 11.6. There we go. I'm not expecting to see true battery voltage again because we're at 1% less with our duty cycle, but we were able to see power side control happening being fed to our solenoid. All right, kind of cool. That's verifying that that's able to happen, but we're not really loading it. If you wanted to, I'm not gonna show it today because I've showed load testing in other classes and I'm trying to save a little bit of time today. But if you wanted to, you could unplug that connector, plug a bulb into there, and look for that bulb to flash while the vehicle's running. That's gonna tell us that the PCM is applying power 
and that's actually putting it under a small amount of load. All right, so electronically, our solenoid looks good, but we don't really know at this point if our solenoid is able to flow oil. We kind of know that um, we're getting oil in the engine. We have oil in the engine. We're getting pressure because our switch is working, but we don't know if it's able to go to the phaser. So let's unplug our connector, get that guy out of the way, and what we're going to do is we're going to force it to move. Because GM hasn't given me the ability to um, move this with the scan tool, I'm going to move it with jumper leads. All right, let's uh, find my jumper leads. And what we're going to do, we're going to feed this thing with power and ground. Now, when we do this, the engine's obviously going to be running. I mean, it doesn't have to be running right now. If I feed it power and ground right now, it should click. Um, and I guess we can just take a look at that real quick. Ground, power. Okay, it clicks back and forth. You guys probably can't hear that, but I definitely heard it clicking. Now what we're gonna do, we're gonna fire this guy up and we're gonna force this thing to move. And we can look at it in two different ways, three different ways actually, to make sure it's actually moving. Okay, we'll let the idle kind of stabilize. Boy, this thing is noisy. All right, so way number one is we can um, listen, right? Listen for the engine note to change as we vary the position of the intake cam. We should hear this thing run different. Also, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the actual variance. So right now, our intake variance is 16 degrees. We're trying to move our intake cam 16 degrees right now and we're getting nothing because I have the connector disconnected. All right, so let's watch. And you can see this, the PCM is trying to force it to move. All right, here we go. We're gonna move our intake cam. And we have full 25 degrees change. as I jump power and ground to this thing. All right. I'm not gonna bother doing it, but you can do the same thing with the exhaust cam. What that's actually able to verify is that the solenoid is functioning, plus now we know it's flowing oil. Because when we open that solenoid all the way, we allow that oil to flow through, it's going into our cam phaser, and we actually see our intake cam angle vary the maximum amount it's physically allowed to, 25 degrees. We see it change our cam sensor, or change the reading for the cam sensor, its maximum amount. Okay, This is telling me that we have adequate flow, we have a functional solenoid, and we have a what really just looks like a, a functional system. It appears to me that we're not dealing with an oil issue. We're not dealing with a solenoid issue. So what happens if you get to this point, you're dealing with a PO11 or a P0014 code, and your solenoid checks out fine, your oil checks out fine, and your wiring checks out fine, which would really be the next step, right? Just to look at our wiring. What if all of this checks out fine? Which we've done a lot of these tests already. The one thing we haven't looked at so far was debris. Is it possible that our solenoid could be full of debris? Sure. If it's easy to check, it'd be something simple that we can do. In fact, this one, super simple. We'll just pull a, pull a single 10 millimeter bolt And uh, you would want to blow off any residue or anything that would be in the valve cover here. As we drip oil all over the place. There we go. And we would just do a quick inspection of these screens. Check if they're plugged up with stuff. This one looks good. Okay, not full of any junk. 
So at this point, we're gonna stick this guy back in. I'll have to clean up that oil. Again, it's a nice secure tight fit in there. It's um, Don't force it because you could end up wrecking something. Of course, I dropped the screw. The bolt. There we go. All right. So with wiring, like I said earlier, we could bulb test it because I don't like resistance testing. So we can see if the PCM is able to keep up. Pin drag, I guess, if you have an intermittent condition. Um, check for loss of connection within the connector itself. Figure out if the terminals are loose. Voltage drop, you know, run the system and, and perform a voltage drop test. would we'll be good to go. Make sure that can't be accurate. 600 people watching right now? Is that legitimate? 600 people? Wow. Hmm. You guys are really trying to get me to do some amperage testing. I actually don't even have an amp clamp out right now. Thank you to all 608 viewers that are watching right now. That's awesome. Yes, that's... Um, Somebody just mentioned it. Stretch chain, looking at a change, chain issue. That's really what we're gonna go after next, looking at our timing chain itself because we are dealing with timing chain issues a lot today. I've already mentioned the 3.6 in the GM, the 3.5 EcoBoost, the 2.4 liter GM. We're stretching chains, the four liter Toyota. Um, what do you do to verify? The chain can cause an issue that is reflected as a variable valve timing code. So do we scope it or do we disassemble? This is really going to be a decision that you have to make and here's, here's why. Are the sensors easy to access? Is the PCM easy to access? Do we have to pull a lot of stuff apart to get to our signals for cam and crank correlation to check our cam sensors and our crank sensors? Is there a more efficient option? Is this side, the disassemble and inspect, easier? Do we have a known good available? I'm not even gonna bother hooking the scope up, which I'm sure you guys have already seen is hooked up to our PCM, but I wouldn't bother hooking the scope up if I'm gonna pull intake, exhaust, and crank sensor signals if I have nothing to compare it to. If I don't have anything to say, hey, that's accurate, there are, I don't know, six teeth from the crank sensor in between my, my first cam sensor pulse right here. If I have nothing to compare that against, what is the point of capturing it in the first place? A known good here is gonna give us that ability to make sure that we're actually in time. Now you could capture it, actuate the solenoid and, and watch it move, but that doesn't tell me that base timing is good. We got to have something to compare it to. Maybe there's something in service information. Maybe there's something on that automotive uh, waveform page out on group out on Facebook. Maybe there's stuff out on IETN or Diag.net or the World Wide Web. Anywhere. Look for a known good. When you have that, you'll have the ability to compare. Or rip the valve cover off. 1.4 hour labor time for that to compare your cam timing marks. Some engines, there's maybe a, a little sight window you can pull off and look at your cam timing. But you have to be able to verify base mechanical timing. Now it's very important when you're verifying your base mechanical timing of the engine, we saw this engine with the solenoid unplugged trying to grab 16 degrees of advance on the intake cam, right? So when we were idling, warm idle because the engine's warm right now this thing was trying to advance our camshaft 16 degrees if we're trying to check base timing on our engine make sure you put the vehicle in base timing how do you do that just unplug both your solenoids run the engine without the solenoids plugged in now don't do this forever because you are making the engine run less efficiently but for a diagnosis unplug them both pull your cam sensor and crank sensor signals this is going to put your engine in base timing. Unless you have a weird issue where potentially the solenoid is bleeding oil past it, applying oil pressure to the cam phaser, that could potentially be a nightmare to diagnose. But if we're just going to look at timing, let's do it this way. I have 
currently hooked up on the PCM. I did it ahead of time to try to save a little bit of time today, guys. Cam sensors, both of them intake and exhaust, and uh, the crank sensor currently hooked up. Let's get the scope set up and we'll go ahead and take a look at what those look like. We'll just bump it up to 20 volts on everything. We can zoom in later. <laughs> what is going on here? Why do you want your $2 back? Oh, because I'm not going to current ramp it. You know what? I'll go get a current clamp. Jeez. I will grab a current clamp just for you, Keith. <coughs> and look at that. The batteries actually aren't even dead. I kind of have an issue with leaving my current clamps on sometimes. All right, we'll bump it into the 20 amp range. We'll check this after we grab our base timing because I do have the solenoids unplugged right now. I sent him another $2. Oh, jeez. You guys, you're lucky this is live, Keith. All right. All right, so again, just to reiterate and make sure I don't have anything that's going to potentially cause issues under the hood right now, uh, we do have... Everything clear, our solenoids are unplugged. Let's grab some base timing. Hopefully my back probe connections are all still good and look at that, they are. Beautiful. Green and red, Christmas colors. 47 days, right Keith? Uh, green and red are our cam signals. Crank signal in blue, we'll just stop it there. Shut this off just so you guys don't have to listen to it. And let's take a look at what we've got. Kind of get these a little closer together. And we'll just look at a little bit here. So this is a lot of engine revolutions here. You can tell by our, our gap. One, two revolutions. Okay. So we'll grab two revs. There we go. So this is what our base timing looks like for this engine. Okay. The reason why we're grabbing two rotations of the crankshaft is because the crank has to spin twice per cam revolution, right? So really what we're grabbing here is a single cam revolution. Now what we can do is we can check and see where our camshaft lines up against the crank. And again, a known good is important. Thank you out to Justin Miller out from the, the Facebook group for a known good. And thank you to Tony for a known not so good. We'll use that in a second. But let's grab our known good real quick. Take a peek. So what we're looking for is we're, we're just going to grab a point. We're going to cross the cam sensor against the crank sensor. And we're just going to take a look and see what we see. Now, I'm, I'm not sure his... Intake cam is labeled in red and his exhaust cam is labeled in green. Um, I did not, uh, <laughs> I did not look to see which one I put where when I hooked, uh, hooked this one up. I'm also not sure, and it doesn't state anywhere here in our known good, if the variable valve timing solenoids were disconnected when this thing was run. Knowing Justin, they probably were, but again, hard to know for sure. So we're looking at this signal crossing just outside of our, or, or in our open gap. And if I remember on this one, our red signal has crossed before the open gap. So that's interesting. And our, oops, our green one, it's not even close. So it looks like the red here looks like my red here is also an intake intake signal and we're one two three let's go in here one two three four our downward swing on the cam sensor here our, our falling edge is 
four teeth before the opening. Okay, let's use that as a reference point. Let's look at our, our opening here, but which one were we looking at? Let's go back and make sure that we're looking at the right part. So it's, it's large, large, and then we start to the short one. So it's right after the short tooth, we go to our open gap, large, large. So right after our short tooth, we go to the open gap. So again, this one, from our known good here, appears to be further to the right or further advanced. Our falling edge here is actually significantly further to the right than this one. So they're very different looking. Okay? So either this one is being advanced by the, the engine right now, or I'm looking at the wrong one, but I'm not. The exhaust cam right here isn't even lining up here. So unfortunately, our known good and the engine I'm currently working on is not, um, and sorry, this would be the timing being retarded. It's coming up later. So this is actually timing retard. This is actually would be timing advance. Um, according to what we're looking at here, these two are not lining up with our known good. Of course. Let's take a look at our other cam here and see where that lines up. Let's see if we can find somewhere for that to line up. All right, a couple teeth after on our first short tooth, we're three teeth after. One, two, three, four teeth after on this one. So again, a little bit different. Um, but again, these are both known good vehicles, okay? So this is where you have to understand what it is that you're looking at. And, and sometimes why it's nice to capture your own known goods so you know the variables. Um, both our VVTs are unplugged right now. I don't know if Justin's were when he captured this. Is that playing into this at all? I'm not sure. Is my brain not working because I'm currently live and I'm missing something very obvious? That's also possible, but usually you guys would call me out in the chat for that. Um, Okay, thank you, Justin. Justin just clarified that um, unless it's noted, his solenoids would be plugged in, okay? So if I wanna verify with this, then I would wanna plug it in and read it again. So let's do it. Uh, we'll get back to our base setup. We'll plug these guys back in. And now you gotta remember it is possible that our vehicle does different things based upon temperature or really whatever the car wants to do at that point. Are we going to change this? It's also possible that because I've now coded that I won't get any advance out of this thing. Let's see what the vehicle wants to do. All right, let's bring the scan tool up, please. Right now we are desiring 16%, we're seeing 16 or 17%. So we're seeing some adjustment. I would assume that Justin's uh, measurement was done at idle. And I believe he had just said that. Uh, so let's just pause it here. And let's take a look at this one. I'm gonna shut the vehicle off. And now we'll see where we line up. Alrighty. Well, that's already looking better, right? Our red trace, let's get green out of the way. Our red trace falls in. Now our, let's call it our leading edge is one, two, three, four, five teeth before our opening. Look at the other signal. Look at the same thing. One, two, three, four, five teeth before the, op oops, sorry about that guys. Five teeth before the opening. There we go, known good on this side, our intake cam on this side, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. Beautiful, right? Let's check our other cam. 
and we'll go right here. So we're one, two, three, four, four teeth after. One, two, three, four teeth after. Make sense, guys? Now, thank you to Justin and commenting in the chat. Now are known good matches. All right. Now let's use Tony's diagram quick to show you guys a known not so good. And I think he just had one camshaft uh, shown in here. All right. All righty, let's take a look. And now I want to make sure that we're capturing in the same spot. We're looking at the cam shaft intake advanced jumped time known bad. Thank you, Tony, for labeling your recording so well. Uh, so we're looking at the intake cam. So again, we're looking at intake cam is going to be channel B is red. So we'll pull that out of the way. We'll look at a red channel and we'll look at the short, long, long. We'll look right here. And again, we're just making sure we're looking at the same spot. And this point right here, one, two, three, for our leading edge is actually happening three teeth beforehand. Oops. So a significant change on our known bad. Okay. So that's the type of stuff that we're looking for when we're looking for this to happen. Now let's get rid of both of these. We'll show some amperage now. <coughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to force it to move. We're going to watch the camshaft change. Uh, maybe a little too long, we'll go there. We'll watch both cam sensors, our crank sensor, and we'll watch some current on this thing. Now I'm going to force it with um, just jumping power and ground. Uh, I don't think it's going to pull more than 20 amps. We're in channel 4 for that guy. We'll, uh, the wire harness is not exposed enough to get around a single wire. And I don't Now I could put an inline jumper harness in here so I don't have to peel this back at all. That's still not enough. But I'll just put some tape on here because all we're doing is just protecting the wires. All right, I'm gonna start by zeroing out my clamp and it doesn't really matter which one you apply it around, either positive or negative. The current will be consistent in the circuit. There we go. And... What am I doing? What am I doing, guys? I can't command this thing with the... With the with the vehicle, with the scan tool. If you could, we would want to look at current on there, but I can't because, yeah, we'll do it two ways. We'll start by looking at jumping the power in the ground, which will give us a full field current. It'll give us what this thing is going to work at, at a maximum. So we'll start by looking at that. We'll watch the camshaft shift, and then we'll let the vehicle run it, and we'll look at the current on there as well. Does that make sense? I hope it does. All right. <clears throat> All 
All right, let's back that off. Shut the car off. All right. In proper scoping etiquette, I would turn this signal around, but um, amp, amp and a half, let's call it, 1.3 amps when we're, when we're force, forcing this thing to move. Um, that's our window in which it moved. Let's look at when I release the power and ground. So um, I was actuating the intake, so I'm going to get green completely out of the way, bring current up. And let's see here, our red trigger, again, we've changed the camshaft here, we returned it back to normal. This yellow line right here is when it, when it returned back to normal. So now we're crossing, see how we're crossing our, our point right here? So not this one, because again, we got to spin the crank twice. This one should be the same. So now we just released it here. Oil takes a small amount of time to flow, right? Or to stop flowing. We should see our change begin to happen. So we were, we were pretty much dead center on the missing tooth, dead center on the missing tooth. But look, we're starting to shift again, right? We're starting to go back to a normal spot. And as we continue on, we're shifting slightly back even, even further. So we're going back to, and then at, at this point here, we should see it, um, should see it return to normal. So we shut it off one, call this a half. So roughly two and a half crank revolutions ish to get back to normal. Now let's look at our turn on. How long did it take to move? This is what Keith was talking about, about the time that it takes to occur. And now my power, the, the movement of the solenoid wasn't perfect. I didn't clamp it on there perfectly. But we're looking for this thing to shift. So we're, we're turning it on. Here's where it actually is kind of going to turn on and move. And we're just before our opening, right? We're back. This is basically our, our zero timing right here. And we begin to shift it here and right about here. So really we're looking at about the same distance here when we look at our from our turn on time to our turn off time the actual time that the phaser takes to move and shift that cam is roughly the same now we could throw rulers in there we could measure it out and we could really figure this out but at the end of the day we're close we're dealing with a car that doesn't have problems if you're dealing with a car that does have problems this is something you'd want to look very close at and actually do the measurement from the time that it goes from uh, I think it was positive 25 on our scan tool when I force feed it. So from zero to positive 25 degrees, how long did it take for the cam to respond from the time the solenoid was turned on to the time the solenoid was turned off? Okay, you'd want to look at that. Also, what we want to look at, and uh, since we just have this up on the screen right now, I, I'll, I'll look at it. But um, this is our crank sense, or our, yeah, our crank signal here. What? Um, Earlier on, I, I mentioned that six degrees being a, oops, a, um, a number to keep in mind. Let's throw some rulers up here quick. I know it might be hard for you guys to see, but right there, that value says 58. So our edges, our teeth, basically, we're counting the teeth on the reluctor wheel or the trigger wheel of the crankshaft, we have 58 teeth, okay? 58 teeth, this is considered a 60 minus two trigger wheel. So really we have 60 teeth, we took two away to give us our little, our little opening, our little gap there. What that tells me, if we take that and put that into 360 degrees, we have a tooth every six degrees, right? If we have a tooth every six degrees, if we jump one tooth, we jump six degrees. So if our timing chain jumps one tooth, we have set a P0011 or P0014 code, right? Six degrees, 16 and 17 code was 10 degrees, remember? If that happens, if we jump one, two, six degrees on the crankshaft. Um, 
Okay, let's look at amperage. We'll actually look at the vehicle controlling it now. Because I think at warm idle we'll see it at that 16 degree mark again. We'll hook up our amp clamp on there. Get the scope rolling. And unless the car's mad because we set a check engine light, let's just take a look and see. <laughs> if we look at the scan tool, we're already looking at a 16 degree advance. Um, that's what our amperage is actually looking like. Uh oh. There we go. We pause this. This is this is our amperage bouncing back and forth. Um, I just pulled the green trace out. I'm gonna put the green trace into the pulse with modulated power. So we can take a look at that in relationship to our amperage. All right, our amperage is a little hard to see, so we'll increase our scale. There we go. We'll zoom it in a bit. Kind of makes sense now, right? We apply power, our amperage, or excuse me, we apply power, our amperage increases, we release power, our amperage goes down. We apply power, it increases. Makes sense? hard to tell if we're actually seeing the movement occur, the pencil change occur. I mean, we're definitely seeing, it's not perfectly, it's not a perfect straight line. So we're actually, the amperage is reflecting a physical movement. You can see a little bit of an upward arc here and a little bit of a downward arc here. I believe that means, I believe that that's a representative of our solenoid actually moving. Okay, let's kill the engine. I thought this was gonna be a short class, guys. I really did. I thought, you know, I'm gonna cover this in 45 minutes. Um, well, that didn't happen. Um, I think I've shown everything that I've looked to, to do today. Yeah, there might be an exhaust leak on there, Frank. Um, but there's no check engine light. <laughs> All right, uh, <laughs> I've earned an extra seven dollars. <laughs> oh yeah, um, I think that was it. I guess we can get to the t-shirt question now. Uh, <laughs> Does anybody have anything else that they wanna see related to this GM 2.4 liter today? Um, we've kind of played with the scan tool, we've played with the scope, we've looked at the, the solenoid being turned on and off, we've measured and, and looked at the timing of all of that. Um, any further questions? Anybody looking for anything else to cover today? Again, that's the fun of being live. I hadn't planned on showing amperage, but uh, Keith convinced me to show amperage. Um, just another valuable test that you can use when you're diagnosing these systems. Because remember, we have a hydraulic aspect, we have an electromechanical aspect, and we have a 
base engine mechanical aspect all dealing with variable valve timing. It can be very tricky, um, <laughs> very tricky to, to diagnose these, these systems. Um, Frank, I'm not sure on the engine code if it's an LE5. I, I, honestly, I don't know. Um, okay, let's do the t-shirt question. Now, let's start with, for those of you, since there appears to be a lot of new people, this is our t-shirt that you can only earn. You cannot buy this shirt anywhere unless one of you guys who's earned it is selling it on eBay, and if that's the case, I'll be very upset with you. I want you guys to wear these things proudly. Diagnose before you triagnose. Right? We don't want to be parts changers or parts swappers or whatever you want to call it. Earn this shirt by answering this question correctly. Oh, hang on. Richard's got a question. If it uses three-wire sensor, could you monitor the signal line on the cam and crank, move it by hand, and watch for it to go, to, to go high? If it uses three-wire sensors, could you monitor the signal lines on the cam and crank, move it by hand? Yes. You could. You could move the engine by hand and watch for the sensor signal to go high key on engine off. Uh, JR or Junior Junior, no, I will not share this PowerPoint file. This PowerPoint file will be found in this video. You can watch it there, but that is the only place that you will be able to access it. We hold those dearly. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that that I do that I don't want to, to share. You're more than welcome to watch it on YouTube as many times as you want. Um, Costa Dinos, Dinos, um, I'm not sure, most scan tools will give you some basic information. I'm not sure if they'll give you everything. You might only be able to see uh, maybe cam variance or maybe desired or maybe actual. Um, a full function tool is definitely going to be the way to go uh, when, when diagnosing this type of system. All right, if you have more questions, post them in here. In the meantime, it's my turn to ask a question, guys. Two techs are discussing trouble codes P0016 and P0017. Now I know again, we did not talk about these codes a lot today, but earlier in the video I did make mention to what the values are in which this code sets, okay? We're talking specifically for our GM 2.4 liter that's sitting right next to me. Tech A says that a single tooth jump on the crankshaft gear cannot cause this trouble code. Tech B says that it can cause this trouble code. Now. Two things here, guys. I can guarantee you this question is not as easy as it seems. I want you to think about it, spend a little bit of time pondering it, because everybody who sends me a correct answer today, and I guess when I thought up this idea that everybody would win a shirt today who gets it right, I hadn't expected 650 people to be watching live. It's a good problem to have. Um, I will probably have to cap the t-shirt giveaway at some point today, but I'm going to cap it at higher than my normal five today. I need to know who is right, tech A or tech B. There is a definitive correct answer here, but I also need to know why. If you give me tech A and you don't explain why, you will not win a shirt, okay? It is simple, straightforward. I want the correct answer and I want to know why. I want you to explain to me why tech A is correct or why tech B is correct. You have until midnight tonight, um, or for those of you who are <laughs> in different time zones, you have the next 11 hours and 26 minutes to get me the accurate answer out to my email, mcbecker at ngksparkplugs.com. Okay, that is your question. This is the t-shirt that you can win. I have most sizes available. Um, yes, and I'm going to cap it at higher than five today. I might give everybody a t-shirt. We'll see what the numbers come in at. The reason that I'm gonna do that today for you guys Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, fortunately for me, probably unfortunate for you guys, the viewers, um, as some of you know, many of you maybe already know, I am having another life-changing event. My wife and I are having another child coming up here in December, and uh, we're adding another little boy to the family. And with that, guys, I have made the personal decision to take a little bit of time away from work with this. Um, I'm fortunate in the fact that the company here gives me vacation time to use, so I have decided to apply that and uh, take a little bit of time away from work to spend with my 
young family. So I hope you guys can appreciate that. Um, I will be back. I'm not going to be doing a December training class or a January training class. I'm sorry. I hope you guys are going to miss me, but we will be back at this in February. Okay. I'll be coming back in February with something else. Uh, same style. We're going to, I don't know. We'll see what comes up in February. Hopefully we'll actually have something actually to diagnose rather than just talk theory and system operation. But um, that is going to be the goal for February is we're going to hit it with something um, like, well, I don't know, whatever, whatever comes up. February is a long time away, but I am going to take a little bit of a, uh, a break and spend it with the family here. So I hope you guys can appreciate that and uh, with the holidays. And it's going to be, it's going to be a crazy time at my house, but I'm looking forward to it. And uh, we're, we're super excited for that. So with that, I figured let's give away some extra shirts today. To, uh, to hold you guys over until February. All right, let's check the comments. I will not be naming the baby Keith as much <laughs> as <laughs> Keith Pico Becker. Yeah, I don't know that my wife would, um, would allow that one, guys. I'm sorry. I, um, uh, <laughs> we have a name picked out. Um, but I, I, we're not really announcing it yet at this point, so I will not, um, I, I will not be announcing it on here because I don't think my wife would be very happy. I can guarantee you his name is not Oz or Sparkplug or um, <laughs> any of that stuff. Um, uh, Mauli Satan, I'll bring the question up on the screen here again for you. Uh, this is the question, again, for those of you who maybe didn't hear it, two techs are discussing the trouble code P0016 and P0017 on our 2.4 liter. The codes were discussed earlier in this presentation. Tech A says that a single tooth jump of the crankshaft gear, our timing chain jumping, one tooth cannot cause this code. Tech B says that it can. Again, guys, I'm stressing this question is not as easy as it sounds, okay? Don't get stuck by the easy answer. Um, I know that's giving away a lot, but I want you guys to really think through this and explain to me why it is what it is, okay? Boris Becker, interesting. You know, for a, for a while there, guys, I was, you know, my, my wife bought this book that had names and we've been searching online and, and, and reading all the, all the different baby boy names and what's popular and, and all that fun stuff. Here, I should have just told you guys about it. You guys are coming up with some great names. I should have just told you guys earlier. We, we might have to change the name now. Uh, Josh, the car in the shop here is a 2012. This is a 2012 Buick Verano, 2.4 liter. TDM, you can toss the coin all you want, but like I said earlier, I'm not going to accept just tech A or tech B. I want to know why. I need a explanation to that question. Marmaduke. All right. Does anybody else have any further questions on this? Uh, do a class, do a cam crank class on the BMW V12. You know, Nick, if you can get me a BMW V12, I'll play with it and I'll put a class together on it. I don't have any BMW V12s at my disposal. Robert of Kennedy. My email address is right here on the screen, mcbecker at ngksparkplugs.com. That's where you're sending that email with your question. Tech A or Tech B, who is correct and why? Land Rover. Don't have a lot of Land Rovers at my disposal either. Um, I have to work on the cars that are in this area and we have a lot of, I mean, we've, we've shown some European stuff, but we have a lot of domestic and Asian vehicles in this uh, in this area but if any <laughs> ricky bobby jeez if anybody is near this area and wants to bring me something fun to work on i'd be happy to take a look and and play with it a w style engine that would be interesting as well um there's a lot of really good things to cover the issue is guys i don't want to cover anything that i can't put in front of you you know that's that's part of this whole thing is this is real this is a real car that drives down the road. You know, that's part of what makes this, at least for me, makes this interesting, makes this fun, is I can put the stuff in front of you guys. 
I don't want to just show you a presentation of some screenshots and some stuff like that that maybe isn't even my information. I want to show you guys in real time, show you that you can do this too, okay? You can hook the scope up to the PCM and check your cam crank. You can throw an amp clamp on it in a few seconds. You can do all of this stuff yourself too. You can put a meter on it. You can diagnose this in real time. I mean, we've been at this now for an hour and 40 minutes. Um, if you're diagnosing this problem and you're an hour and 40 minutes in already, you're probably pretty upset because, especially if you didn't clear any additional labor to uh, diagnose this thing further. But, um, you know, as we work through this, it's very, um, just try to be real world with you guys, you know, share experiences. Um, Keith, great question. A little bit of a... Uh, I try not to include too much of the stuff because it feels too much salesy, but Keith's question is where we can find the makes and models that NGK makes the oil control solenoids for. Um, you can head out to ngksparkplugs.com and you're going to look under the WVE brand. Under the WVE brand you will find um, vehicles that we have them for. They're not going to be under the NGK or the NTK name, they will be under the WVE name. All right. We'll see you later, Kevin. Thanks for, for joining us. Um, I think that's it, guys. I will see all of you in February, all right? The first Thursday in February is the plan to return. Um, I guess I'll put a date to it quick, then I can hold myself to it. Let's plan on February 6th, everybody. Okay, February 6th, that's gonna be the tentative, most likely be here on February 6th date. For our next class, again, I have no idea what we're going to cover. It's a long ways away, but um, I'm going to enjoy spending time with family. I'll probably run into you guys in the comments section on this video or other videos. I hope everybody has a really great holiday season, and we'll see you all next year. Thank you very much for joining me today. All of you, all the new faces, I really look forward to reading some emails later this afternoon. So thank you guys again for sticking it out for an hour and 45 minutes. We'll see you in February. Happy wrenching, everyone. Thank you.